Welcome to Raymore Christian Church in Raymore, Missouri. We are part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada. We welcome you to this service. We are taping. You are here, but others are with us out in television land. Woohoo! We are doing several things here, and uh, as noticed, uh, we are going to have several people helping in our worship service. I am the Reverend Karen Yacht. I am a retired minister, and I am a moderator of the Raymore Christian Church Board. We are in the process of a search for a new pastor, so you will see several different faces through the weeks. This morning, our guest speaker is our regional minister, Bill Roseheim. Yay, Bill. And it is the region, it is this regional minister that will help us in the weeks ahead to find a new pastor. So we look forward to seeing more of Bill and having him with us. It was hoped this week that you would be seeing, seeing things in the mail, email or in the mail. Uh, that didn't happen. As you know, trying to work things up and get things rolling, they don't always roll as they should. Um, I went last night to type something on the computer I needed to run off, and when I went back to copy it, it was gone. Oh well, I didn't need it anyway, right? You will need what we are going to provide for you. And there are copies of the budget that we're going to look at for next year. There's copies of leadership that we are asking to help us in this coming year. And so you will have available those. There are some laying around. Uh, if you haven't found one, we'll make sure you have one before you leave. The other thing that we had hoped to try to do on our email was to let you know of concerns, joys, activities of the church, and like the papers that we wanted to email, uh, we found a stumbling block. So we do have available for you. If you didn't pick one up, we'll make sure you get one later. It has all kinds of items on it for you to be aware of what is going on and the concerns we have for people. Um, I want to first, uh, we've had uh, Ed Jenkins, Pat Jenkins' husband in the hospital this week. He hopes to come home today. Uh, he has had tests. It has determined there will need to be some other treatment, so we are waiting with her to see what that is gonna mean. Steve Salisbury, Levi DeAngelis, Caden Hall, and, uh, and Pat, I see you, is uh, Jack Johnson, still we need him to be in our prayers. Friend of Pat's, we need to be concerned about him and his family. Um, Roberta Shivers, who is uh, Beth Rankin's sister, has a grandson that they are very concerned about. Something of the problems in the pandemic has caused problems with him. So we need to be praying for them. These are the kind of things I hope that you will share with me and let me know. In our regional office, we have a, a woman, I started to say young woman, but everybody's young. Uh, Jessica Lopez, her father had surgery and now her mother has been tested positive so we need to be thinking about Jessica so please look at the notes that I, I hope to provide for you and uh, you will see a list uh, on the right of that page that tells the people who are going to be filling the message part of our service as we meet in the next four weeks so I'm happy that they are sharing with us 
Last week, we welcomed Amber and Jeremiah, Connie and Dale, and uh, that's been a great week, made a great week uh, to get started on our new beginnings, and we welcome you into our church. The global prayers this week include Indonesia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Japan. You and I are a part of missions and work in all of those countries, and we lift them up in prayer. Here we are together as a family of God. Let us worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time to be with fellow Christians. Thank you that we can assemble and praise you. We come this morning to worship, praise, and thank you for your gifts. Also, Lord, we want to present our worries and hurts and angers at your feet. Please keep them and help us to leave them as we learn to serve you. Be with us now as we continue to praise and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. It's time for our children's moment. If anybody wants to come on up, keep me company while I tell you a story. Welcome, girls. Um, so for children's moment, we're going to start by lighting our Christ candles, similar to what we do in Worship and Wonder. And in Worship and Wonder, we say that we light the Christ candles to remind us that God is with us in this place when we come together to hear his special stories. And there we go. All right, we're going to play a couple word games together-ish. I have some fun tools we're going to use. So today I'm going to hope to teach you about sources of authority. Ashley just kind of looked like, what are you saying? Right? Sources of authority, what does that mean? It means who can you trust to give you good answers? So I'm going to give you two examples. I need to know the meaning of the word fantastic, and I need to know how to spell the word fantastic. So we have two choices. We have a dictionary, right? A dictionary has all the words you can possibly imagine, how to spell them, what they mean. Do you think it would be easy to find the word fantastic in this book? No, uh-uh. Would it be fast to find the word fantastic in this book? You're right, probably not. Do you think what's in this book would tell you a really good definition and be sure that it's telling you the right way to spell it? Probably. All right, so choice two is this book. Andrea's Book of Words. Right? It's not a very big book. It'd be really easy to use. And look, there's only one definition in Andrea's book of words, and it's the word we happen to need to know how to spell. Does this look like a reliable source of information? The definition of fantastic, by the way, is just like Andrea. Yes, that is so true, right? I don't think that's spelled right. Doesn't look right. Does the spelling on the front look right to you guys? I don't think so either. This was really easy and really fun. This is a little harder, but gets you good info. So easy isn't always the best. I'm gonna give you one more example. Let's say you're at school or at home, and you have, do you guys have laptops that you do homeschool with? Or a tablet of some sort? A tablet, okay. So let's say you're sitting there working along, and all of a sudden your tablet freezes, and it stops working. Oh my gosh. Um, what would you do? You could call up mom or dad, or an adult in the house, and say, help me, my tablet's not working, right? Or... I looked on the internet the other day, and I found an article that says, if your tablet's not working, you push and hold the power button until everything turns off, and then you bang it on the ground five and one half times, and it fixes everything. Would that be a good source? Am I a good source of authority on fixing a tablet? No. When our lecture, it would just break it but it might feel really good in that frustrated moment to pound our tablet on the ground. But as soon as we did that, we would be like, ah, not good. Right? What's wrong with me? Why did I do that? So the best way to do things isn't always the easiest. No. I have one other book here. What book is this? The Bible. Is this a good source of authority to help us know how to treat our friends and family and strangers we meet? Yes, yes, good answer, Ashley. Yes, it is. Is it always easy to find the information we need in here? No, it sure isn't. Is it always easy to do the things Jesus teaches us to do? Is it always easy to be nice to everyone we meet? 
It's not, I'll be honest, it's not, sometimes it's really hard, but it is the right thing to do. So sources of authority, little vocab lesson, little spiritual lesson. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we thank you for making us smart and curious. We thank you, Lord, for the many ways we have to learn and the people in our lives who help answer our questions. Help us to always look to trusted people when we need your help and always follow the path of Jesus. Amen. Thank you girls very much. Earlier this week, I had the wonderful privilege of participating in a retreat with the Excellence in Ministry program through our denomination. This is the program that helps newly ordained and newly commissioned ministers um, come together to learn and share story and just build some bonds. In our opening worship service, I heard um, a quote from a book. Um, it's a financial book, but it crosses all lines. And this quote stayed with me and stirred in me some things and thoughts that I hadn't considered. And so when I was planning my table invitation for you all, the only thing that came to mind was this quote. So I'd like to share it with you now. 
This is a quote from the book, A Spirituality of Fundraising by Henry, Henry Nowen. And the quote says this, And what God wants us to know is that before we think or do or accomplish anything, before we have much money or little money, the deepest truth of our human identity is this. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. With you, I am well pleased. With you, I am well pleased. The days that it takes everything in our power to get up, get the kids to school, keep the family fed and on schedule without the house burning down around us. With you, he is well pleased. On the days that the isolation of the pandemic turns our hearts more angry and judgmental than compassionate and loving, even on those days, with you, he is well pleased. In the days of excellence and in the days of despair, the times were soaring and the times were deeply in need. Yes, even in those moments. With you, he is well pleased. You and I are assured of that fact every time we join together at this table. Every time we come together united and recall the night that Jesus met with his disciples and how he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and offered it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup and after giving thanks for it, he offered it to them, saying, Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. I invite you now to hold your uh, communion elements in your hands as we pray together over bread and cup. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we gather together at your table to partake in the ritual of bread and cup, we stand before you knowing that we too have been given the authority through the acceptance of your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we have the authority to love the least of these. With him, we have the authority to have a faith combined with actions that can move mountains. And in him, and with the unity of the Holy Spirit, we have the authority to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you our God. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
let us spend some time with God in prayer. In the quiet around us, in the stillness that sometimes is hard to find, we reach for your presence. As each of us struggle with daily chores, we struggle too much of the time trying to find, is there a presence to guide us or not? This day, we come to you, O oh God, to let your presence lead to guide, but to help us look ahead, not in anxiety, but in hope. We really know who is in charge. It's just hard to let go and let you be the guiding force. We know who the authority is in our life but we really want to hold the reins and direct the course. We have friends and family who need our prayer. Let us not forget that. Let us know that as we reach out, even in these words, they find strength. We reach around the world knowing that friends of ours in other countries not only look for you, but look for things of need in their lives. Whatever it takes, oh God, let us be the answer. As we look for guidance in our church in the weeks ahead, we know that we don't have all of the answers hold, holding out in our hands, but we have ways to find the answers. So let us look. Let us be always on alert. Here we are, God, a, a group of folks, a handful of Christians, but a multitude of answers to the needs of the world. Help us in this time to let your presence guide us. We pray for our speaker, for the message he brings, that we may be filled, that we will listen and hear the word. For it is in the name of the Christ who gave us the answers, we pray. Amen. I'm just glad you're okay. I am. <laughs> All right. I'm going to learn this thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that someone took the time to provide something like that so that you could get up and down. And isn't that the story of the church? As needs become apparent, we step up, we reach out, we make accommodation. I'd like to read from the Gospel of Mark beginning with chapter 1, verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. 
they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God bless our hearing, our taking in, and our living out of God's holy word. Well, good morning, Ray Moore Christian Church. And thank you, Reverend Karen Yao, for the invitation to worship with you this morning. And I want to thank the many volunteers who continue to worship, reach out in service to neighbors, and offer care to one another during one of the most difficult times faced by this or any congregation in recent history. How we show up and speak and act in times of challenge reveals so much about what we truly believe and how much spiritual integrity we have or lack. I know something about that lack. Yesterday while in, yesterday morning while installing plumbing in our house, matching 35-year-old fittings with the new pieces I had picked up from Lowe's, um, I couldn't get the connections to work. Frustration does not begin to describe the mood and, and, and finally, after many failed attempts, exhausting my vocabulary. You would have thought I was possessed by an unclean spirit. And two more trips to the hardware store, it finally came together without leaks. I checked this morning, still no leaks. Reflecting on this experience last night, though, I was embarrassed to notice that it had not occurred to me to pray for wisdom and patience. This is not the first time that I have not exercised the authority given to me by God. I remember so vividly being on the top of the Middle Teton in the middle of August and a snowstorm. The wind was blowing at about 30 miles an hour and those snow crystals were stinging us like needles. And I had come up, careless as I was, in my shorts and t-shirt. I'm standing on top of the mountain and up comes a family, a mom and two kids who are very well prepared. One of her sons offers me an extra pair of snow pants that he happened to have in his backpack. And it was the mother who made the decision that we ought to pray for guidance to make our way down the mountain when we could not see 10 feet in front of us. Today I bring greetings from our General Minister and President, Reverend Terry Hort Owens, who some of you may know has a Facebook page on which she posts very inspiring video messages for the whole church. Terry understands social media and she's taking full advantage to try to encourage us and inspire us to be what we are called to be in this time. And this week, she's participating in a Kansas City-based webinar on Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And we posted information about that on our GKC Facebook page. That's free, by the way, that webinar that's going to happen on Tuesday afternoon. And that letter from the Birmingham jail is as relevant today as it was when it was written in April of 1963. And if you've not yet read our general minister and president's recent letter to the Christian church, 
inviting us to become the church we say we are, I would invite you to go to disciples.org, and it's right there on the home page. I do encourage you to read that, or the transcript, or see the video. Her words and her leadership are coming from someone who knows a lot about authority. By the way, that word authority, I was so glad to hear that in the children's message, thank you, has never been more important to church life. And it is the focus of this message that I believe God wants us to hear, not only today, but often in the days to come. It was certainly important, that word, in the time of the, that Mark wrote his gospel. Authority, the Greek word that Mark uses, exousia, and it means power, authority, control, dominion, or sway. There are several types of authority, we know that. There's a legal authority. For the privilege of driving a car in Missouri, I have to observe the speed limit. If I'm going 80 miles an hour down I-49, the state highway patrol officer certainly has the authority to pull me over. There's a moral authority, often based on a belief system. If, as a disciple of Jesus, I become aware of a neighbor who has lost a job and is having difficulty feeding their children, I am commanded by Jesus to do something about that. There's also what I call noetic authority. We might say that this is a kind of moral authority that is so well integrated into the life of a person that when they speak, even strangers are inclined to listen. And maybe we know, each of us, we've met a few people in our lifetimes who have a similar kind of authority. Jesus certainly had that authority. So filled was he with God's Holy Spirit and his teaching still means a great deal to 2.3 billion people today who self-identify as Christian. Now that's some authority. When Mark writes his gospel, Many of the disciples of Jesus, those first followers, had died, and there were many new Christians who had never met Jesus in person. What they knew of Jesus was mediated through those who either knew him 40 years back, or who taught about him, or modeled for them Christ-likeness. I see growing evidence that the wider church in North America has an issue with authority. More and more I hear talk of my church, our church. Truth is, there would be no church were it not authorized by Jesus. To make more sense of this part of Mark's gospel, it helps to remember that Jesus had begun his ministry after being baptized by John and spending 40 days in the wilderness. One of my favorite authors, Dr. Belden Lane, spends a great deal of time backpacking in the Ozarks. He takes overnight hikes along several of the trails, and sometimes he'll spend a night by a river bank or sometimes on a ridge line, where he has only the rock and the wind as companions. And he writes this about wilderness and what it does to people's spirituality. What people commonly report as most unsettling about their experiences in wilderness land, yet also most healing, is its defeat of the grasping ego. It makes them aware of their total inability to control anything. Wilderness becomes an accomplice in the spiritual work of deconstructing the false self. Survivors of outward bound programs frequently talk about finding a new integrated self, and that enhances their openness to wilderness and cooperation with each other. In, ta in being taken to their limits, they experience an increase of self-worth, mutual respect, and even transcendent awareness. Of course, we don't have to travel very far these days to experience wilderness. Over the past two Fridays, uh, Don and I have laid flooring 
set a new stool, vanity, and sink in a bathroom, and neither one of us has much plumbing experience, but we can watch videos, read instructions, and follow them. Things were going smoothly, and I told you what happened next. But more than that, we're in a wilderness time that we have not seen before in our nation. And we're also experiencing a lot of that in our churches, in our congregations. Life has changed so much that many of the models that we have for being the church are no longer working as well as they did once before. It's nobody's fault. Nobody planned for this. Life involves change. That's the one thing we can count on. Back to Mark's story. We recall that he went to Capernaum, a village on the northwest shore of Lake Galilee, about 1,500 people, the archaeologists will say, including Simon Peter's mother-in-law. They made their home here. A home in the time of Jesus had been much smaller than many of the homes that we would find today in Raymore, and that's important to know because in that time people lived closely together. Relationships were very important. Economic survival often depended upon the collaboration of neighbors helping each other. And there was one synagogue. And if you were a practicing Jew, that's where you went to pray and study scripture. It wasn't like in the US in a village of 1,500 people where you might find 10 or 15 different churches or different houses of worship. And you can have your pick of whatever feels most comfortable. In that one synagogue, a person who had an unclean spirit shows up. Regardless of how one thinks about being possessed by an unclean spirit, we can easily overlook the fact that this man made his way into the synagogue. Either the entryway was open or someone let this person in. Likely he was one of the villagers, but he could have been one of those who traveled the Imperial Roman highway that ran parallel to Capernaum. What is someone with an unclean spirit doing in a synagogue anyway? Mark doesn't say. There was a time when the church was very powerful. A time when the early Christians rejoiced being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. That's a quote from the letter from the Birmingham jail by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He goes on to say, by their efforts, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. Then he goes on to say, things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often even vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, our authorization. He goes on to say several others, but I'm gonna stop here and say, I know that this is hard to hear and I wish it didn't have to be said. But I get to worship in 74 different congregations throughout the region and in other congregations as well. And what Martin Luther King said back in 1963 is still true even today, with some notable exceptions. Even congregations that are relatively healthy, sufficiently resourced, and located in an area of slow population and economic growth 
are struggling to inspire people outside the church to become disciples of Jesus Christ and to participate in life within the church. In a recent survey of the eight county greater Kansas City region, fully one third hear this church. One third of the population surveyed expressed no religious affiliation or practice. And that number is growing every single year. The number of nuns having no religious preference and duns, those who've given up on the church, continues to grow. People in church would like to point at changes in popular culture, a me-first mentality, or something else outside the church to explain why there are no large groups of people trying to make their way into the church. Someday I'm going to have to learn how to use this, this phone better as I read a Word document. It only took decades after the first disciples founded churches that some congregations began to loo loo lapse back into becoming more like the culture they were supposed to change. And by the time Mark wrote his gospel, there were already letters from Paul circulating attesting to congregations and congregational leaders who had in some significant ways lapsed into division, conflict, and inward focus. In fact, Paul would enumerate some of those things that he was seeing in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dis dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And he goes on to say, I'm warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul's concerns and those of other Christian scripture authors were not limited to individuals and churches. They were also concerned with the witness those churches were giving to future disciples of Jesus who were not yet part of the church. I'm fascinated as I travel about to hear language that is focused so much on the time of the present without much thought given to the next two or three or seven generations who will need to carry the gospel on. The church has been sharing the good news of Jesus for almost 2,000 years. What are we doing to connect with the youngest generations some of whom are not going to come into our church doors to hear the gospel proclaimed. They need the gospel taken to them. They need the gospel lived in front of them. It's not easy for me to share this, and I assure you before I preach any sermon, I hear the accusations coming right back at me personally. But I believe that this is a, a unique time, a wilderness time is often an opportunity for us to take advantage of fewer distractions. I don't know about you, haven't been to a movie theater. Don and I love to go out to see a, a musical or a dramatic presentation at one of the colleges. We miss that. We miss dancing. We miss doing a lot of things that require socialization. And because we've missed some of those things, it has freed up some more time without distraction to pay attention, closer attention, to what God may be saying to ourselves as individuals, but also to us as congregations and as the church at large. To hear the word of God and clam up in self-defense is to deepen the isolation and desperation that anyone so possessed by destructive thoughts, attitudes, actions, and habits becomes even more isolated and worse, feels a greater distance from the very God who desperately wants to love them and include them in the beloved community. You know, I remember as a kid, sometimes I was not very sociable. I, yeah, I know you'd had this hard to believe that I, I could actually be a, a bad kid now and then, but I definitely was. And I remember being sent to my room, and sometimes my offense was so grave that 
I was appointed to a corner in my room to put my nose up against the corner and not move until I was ready to come out and be a better human being. I was so angry and I was determined I wasn't going to change a whit. In my infantile mind, I was correct and nobody should correct me. And that would last for about 15, 20 minutes and all of a sudden, my body didn't feel as comfortable as it once did. My mind began to wander. I missed my family. And then suddenly it would occur to me, I'm only hurting myself here. They're out having a good time. I'm in here pouting. And it doesn't seem to be doing me much good. Maybe, just maybe, I ought to go out and try to be a fairly decent human being. Being a follower of Jesus, it's been my experience, will break sometimes stony hearts. And in faithful company, we will from time to time, from the mouth of another church member who is growing in Christ's likeness, to say to me, when I am possessed of an unclean spirit, whatever that means to you, what it means to me, is that I'm in a state right now where I am disconnected from God, disconnected from you, and really focused entirely on myself. Someone in the church will say to me, who loves me, Bill, stop. Spirit, that spirit has no place in you. Let it go. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened for me. It's one reason why I'm still in the ministry. I value the people who will not only affirm me, but also challenge me so that I can go deeper and deeper into my relationship with Christ and with you and learn what it means to be fully human, fully alive. Irenaeus, one of the early church theologians said, the glory of God, human beings, fully alive. When was the last time we as church, any church, any congregation, felt fully alive, fully present to God, and fully invested in the mission of God and seeing good things happen? I remember an inv interview with John Wimber, who worked with top professional musicians at the time, and it was not a follower of Jesus. When he really heard the gospel for the first time, he was inspired to join a church. He went to the service filled with hope, and at the end of the service, he went up to the pastor with anticipation, and he said, when do we get to do the stuff? Well, the pastor said, what stuff? He said, you know, the stuff in the Bible, you know, the, the, the loaves and the fishes feeding the thousands and healing the sick. When do we get to do that stuff? And the pastor said, we don't do that stuff here. There was a, tu a tourist who visited Rome in the, in the Renaissance, and as the guide was taking him around Rome, the guide kind of chuckled a little bit and said, as he's looking at all these beautiful monuments and all the gold and the silver, and he says, I guess Peter can no longer say, neither silver nor gold have I. And the visitor said to him, and I'll bet it's been a long time since Peter was able to say to the lame, get up and walk. Authority holy authority is what we need. If we want to be part of the renewal of the church universal in our day, and we have to be renewed, we have to admit that as a church, universal, big C, as a church, we need renewal. We need to reclaim the authority that's been given us by God. Because we are called, chosen, equipped, and sent and I, I want to end this way with something I've been sharing with every congregation that I visit, and I pray that you'll believe me. When God is in charge, when God loves the church, God makes sure that people are in place in its most critical times who can do what is needed to be done for the church to be able to thrive and continue into the future. I don't know how you think about yourself or how you see yourself, but I wish you could believe that God is looking at you right now and going, I did good. I, I, did good. I made a good choice. The people I have chosen for leadership in this time, in this place, are my choice. 
and we have whatever we need to be and to do whatever God calls us to be and to do in this moment. And more than that, we're reminded by the writer of Hebrews that we are surrounded by a communion of saints, and I'll never forget Peter Morgan preaching on this, and he lifted up the image of an Olympic stadium, and there's Jesus walking out ahead of the new athletes, but in the stands are all the athletes that have won their laurel crowns before, and they are on their feet clapping and cheering for these new athletes, and you and I, we in this room, are those athletes that God has chosen for this particular moment to re-energize the authority of the church, to be everything it can be in this culture, to be everything it can be to the people who do not yet know Jesus. We have a cloud of witnesses who are cheering for us, praying for us, encouraging us, counting on us. I hope you feel better. Let's finish this race so that those who come after can finish their race and know and experience the authority of God inside their lives and through their congregations. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. of the Lord go with you wherever he may send you and guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm and bring you back rejoicing at the wonders God has shown you bring you back together through these doors to this beloved community in Jesus name Amen, Amen.